Hmm, g'day, it's Redzik here, and welcome back to Arkham Horror. Well, let's get into this. We're going to do a new game. This is my last, this is major update 2 for the mod, and there's a huge host of changes that I'm keen for you guys to see in action, and also for me to test, which is why I do the playthroughs. And this is going to be my last update for a while. I've been working on this pretty hard, and I've got to get back to, you know, productive work that pays bills so <laughs> i'm gonna have a break from modding for a bit but this is the current state of the nomad you'll note that i've put in the corruption decks and a few more decks and stuff and let's get into this so we're going to use tragic's base setup which has all the stuff one of the big changes is that now you can edit all these base decks and that will be saved into the bag so you can uh, do modifications to the original Arkham Horror card sets as well, which is important if you, you know, making your own things. And I've also added all the Guardians, Heralds and Institutions, which we will be also using. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to get rid of these in here. I'm going to get rid of my Investigators and I'm going to get rid of the Goos. Now, what I've been doing is, as I've been playing, I've been saving into my AH saves uh, a little bag called unused. And this is a list. This is basically, see, I've only got 31 investigators in here. I've only got 26 goos. That's because these are having, these are, miss, these bags are missing the ones that I've already played on my channel. Okay. So I'm just going to add this to the, to the builder. And that way we'll have the correct pull. And we're going to play with everything in again. So we've got the extra Mythos cards. We've got the Mystematonic Madness and Injury cards. We've got uh, the Dunwich Locations, the Dunwich Allies. And we've got all the extra Uniques, Spells, Skills and Commons. And uh, we've got the all monsters, all the mass. Mo uh, actually, we don't have all the mass monsters. That should be all masked monsters. So we've got all the monsters, all the mass monsters, and you know we're going to use the the sixteen gates. In fact, let's just for fun, let's use the lurker gates. as well as the normal gates. Let's just go all out this session. Ya blammo. Let's build that pool. And we'll have to do a lot of thinking. Ya boom. Okie dokie. Now we're actually going to play with the new guardians and everything. So I'm going to grab a guardian, Yablamo. It's Bast. Perfect. This is, you know, because I'm a bit of a cat fan, this is what we're going to play with. Excellent. Let's get the Herald, Yablamo. Oh, Black Goat of the Woods. Okay, this is going to be a short game. <laughs> okay, let's get the institutions. Bam. Ah, Brewer of Investigations. That's actually good for uh, the goat. Not bad. Okay. And let's get our great old one, Yablamo. Oh, and it's Shovel Mel. Awesome. Shovel Mel is one of the best additions to Eldrick Horror in the expansion. Uh, I can't remember what the expansion is called, but there's the expansion that introduces his mechanics of destroying cities. Absolutely the best expansion, in my opinion, to get for Eldrick Horror. Anyway, so we're going to be playing with him as well. Nice. Now, of course, we've already got our investigator pool set up because we built the pool at the beginning and we've got lots of gates because we have a mix of all the gates. Let's run the setup. Yablamo. Okay. And it does all its thing. Boom. And uh, there's a couple of uh, interesting things going on. When... Bass comes into play. We add, if you can see it down in the chat window, we add uh, the Foolish Disciple of Bass gets added to the ally deck. That's the cat ally. And when the, this guy adds in, we create a second monster cup full of just hexagon monsters. So that's some interesting stuff there. 
Okay, so that's basically the setup done. I'm just going to close all these things while we finish the setup. Let's have a quick look at our old one. For starters, he's worshipped by the Cathogians. Okay, so the Cathogians just become ridiculous with this guy. They are, must be hunted down and killed the instant they turn up. So their damage goes from four to six to two to six. That means they've almost got, you know, a one in, they've got a third chance of always going off and hitting every investigator for one uh, stamina on, on activation. So very, very harsh. Must be dealt with. But what's more interesting is the world cracking ability. So while he stirs in his some slumber, there's seven rubble tokens that are up here. So these are the rubble tokens, right? And as you pull them out, they match locations. So this one uh, is, this is the Bank of Arkham. So you stick it on the Arkham Bank like so, and then you just flip it over and that is rubble, okay? And that's the way it works. So these are just rubble tokens. They just denote that the, uh, the the thing is completely destroyed okay so okay let me <laughs> let me try and say that that actually makes sense i'll just read the text while he stirs in his slumber places several rubble tokens face down near the board each time a monster surge occurs draw a rubble token the token is placed on a location it shows closing that location for the rest of the game if there are no rebel tokens left when one should be drawn, the game is over and the investigators lose. So this, what's interesting about this is that this closes locations. All the locations it's closed are unable to have gates open except from various card effects. They are uh, stable locations. So it really does change the board quite a bit, these rebel tokens. So uh, we'll have to deal with that. Let's just shuffle that. Okay, and he's got 12 Doom, which is too bad. Okay, so let's have a look at the Bureau of Investigations. This is one of the new additions from Miss Matonic Horror. It's like a second guardian. These are help you. Now, these range in, you know, how good they are, I suppose. Uh, the the best one is probably the uh, the Sheldon Gang or you know like the criminal organization one. So this is the Bureau of Investigations, and we have these little agent tokens, which some of you who play Arkham Horror uh, LCG might recognize the the graphic I used. Okay, for each monster token, compare the monster's toughness to the number of agent tokens in the same area. If the monster's toughness is equal to or greater than the number of agent tokens, remove one agent token from that area to the pool of agent tokens next to this sheet. If the monster's toughness is less than the number of agent tokens, return one agent token to the pool of agent tokens next to the sheet and return the monster to the monster cup, or in the case of spawn note, monsters to wherever the spawn token was placed during setup. The order in which monster tokens are resolved is determined by the first player. This is a terribly worded bit of instructions. It's very, very large and wordy. And all it's trying to say is that when you have tokens on the board at a given location, you have three tokens. It basically means three attack. If this is larger than the monster's toughness, you discard one token and put the monster back into the cup. Okay. If it is equal to or less than the monster's toughness, you just remove one agent token. That's all it's saying. So this is a way to control to control monsters without actually you having to fight it because the, the US government's basically fighting them for you. During the movement phase, at any point during movement, if an investigator is in the street area, he may place one agent token in his street for each two clue tokens he spends. Note that monsters ignore agent tokens while moving. So what this means is as you move around the board, you can drop agent tokens around. It's quite expensive, two clues, but it's pretty, it's pretty cool. What's interesting about this and why it combos pretty well with the, the black goat, when you'll see in a sec, is that because we're not destroying, using the keyword to destroy these monsters by the players, it doesn't trigger some of the corruption effects that you get from destroying these to destroying the hexagon monsters for the black goat 
So long story short, as we move around, we can drop tokens for two clues. And then when during the upkeep phase, you can compare these tokens to the monsters in the same area and possibly discard them. In addition, you've got the predictive custody uh, ability, which basically is like a lot of these things. It just means that uh, this desert doesn't have any effect without having expansions. So what happens in this is when you return an ally to the game box, instead of returning it to the box, you can place it next to one of the expansion boards. So Dunwich, King's Port or Innsmouth. And if there's an ally already at this location, then it replaces it. And this is just basically the idea is going into witness protection. You can spend five clue tokens to gain that ally. Basically it doesn't have any effect in our game, but I'm going to play that I'm still going to use this ability, but I'm just going to do it for the Arkham board. Okay, so we'll still be able to use this ability, even though it's supposed to only, in inverted commas, be done with Innsmouth. It just means that when you discard an ally, you get a chance to get him back if you spend the clues. Okay. Now we have the Bast, and this is the Protector of Cats. Now, basically, this is what you would think is a cool ability, but kind of isn't that cool. <laughs> it, there's, there's really only, there's really only Hypnos as the, 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 the one that you want to use, but uh, Bast is cool. So basically, whenever an investigator is in a street area during the Arkham encounter phase, so unlike the Bureau of Investigations, we have to physically end our turn in the street, he may spend $2 to feed the stray cats of Arkham's. If he chooses to do so, that investigator takes a Bast token if he does not already have one. At the start of each turn, any investigator with a Bast token must either spend all of his focus or discard the token. Okay, so basically, if you finish in a street, spend $2, get a Bast token. If a monster would enter the same area as an investigator who owns a Bast token during the Mythos phase, the monster remains where it is instead. So you can stop monsters from moving. So you can basically corral them. Okay, so if you have a Bast token, you just sit and you can stop monsters from moving in and out of locations. It's very strong. Bast's favor. When the story continues card pops up, which is actually rare, there's a single card in the Mythos deck, which gets bigger and bigger and bigger with the more expansions you put in called... Uh, the story continues and when that turns up if the first player has a bass token or the foolishest ally he discards any bass tokens and takes the beloved of bass card so there's two cards here and basically it's like the deputy card so it's you actually pick up this entire deck okay so yeah, you get these cards and you get these powers and they're very strong powers that you get for the rest of the game basically so it's very, very hard to get Bass Favor because not only do you have to be the first player, you also have to have either the Foolishness Ally or you have to have a Bass Token and you also need to draw the Story Continues card, which is pretty hard to do. So it's actually very rare, I find, to actually become the beloved of Bast. But what we're really looking at here with the, the Bast Tokens, which are these little cat tokens, is that you can stop monsters from moving during the mythos phase which is actually pretty strong and finally we have the big terror this is in my opinion one of the really hard monster uh, hard uh, <laughs> heralds this is probably going to lose us the game so basically what happens here is all the hexagon monsters in the game get put into this new monster cup right when a gate opens, draw a monster from the cup as normal, then draw a second monster from the hexagon cup and place both monsters at the gate location. When a monster surge occurs, draw half the monsters rounded down from the hexagon cup. Hexagon monsters are not removed from the game board when a hexagon gate is closed. Each time an investigator defeats a hexagon monster, he or she draws a corruption card. That is the killer. So basically, you have these corruption decks over here, right? You've got mild corruption, and then you've got 
hardcore corruption. So these are like shuffled individually. You draw from the green deck. When that runs out, you draw from the red deck. If you ever, these are, these are like game wide bad effects. Okay. And if you ever try and draw a card and there is no card left, then the guy instantly wakes up. And these are basically impossible to get rid of. I think there might be in the later expansions a couple of cut ways to get rid of them, but they're very rare. So these are bad. And basically the idea here is that the Shabnigarath is just spawning, you know, spawning stuff everywhere. It's just monster flood, monster flood. So in the eight player game, which we're going to be playing, instead of drawing two monsters per gate, we draw three monsters per gate. And those, those hexagon monsters, we can't really even kill them because we will get corruptions. Now we will have to kill them. But uh, so we're going to get corrupted. It's going to be very, very hard to stop the surges from happening, basically. And remember, we are playing eight, so we have nothing. We have a zero out of skirts limit, which means it's going to be very, very difficult to uh, stop us from getting, you know, losing the game through surges because it'll be very hard to get, it's almost impossible to control the hexagon monsters. Luckily, we do have on the case, right? And what that means is we can use our agent tokens to discard hexagon monsters. And because the agents are discarding them, not the players, and it's not technically a destruction effect, we won't have to draw corruption cards for that. In addition, dark ones are no longer yellow. They're actually black. And Pagan writes, each time a monster surge occurs, add one doom token. So... Very, very harsh. Every monster surge, we get a doom token. We get all these monsters we can't kill. And it's going to be very, very vicious. So that is a setup. This is not a good setup. This is probably going to, we're probably going to lose this. So I'm just going to roll the dice. So I go, I roll two dice. And when I roll, I roll two dice. And then I start counting at four. Because it's a, out of 12. And the first, and it's always it's the lowest you can do is two. So that is, we got four, five, six. So that's four, five, six. We, this is our first player. Okay, so let's uh, get on to it. So we're going to play with tasks. And we're also going to play with relationships. Okay, so let's have a look at Hank. Hank is a basically a bruiser. Any phase, Hank does not make a horror check when he first encounters a monster. Instead, he only makes a horror check if he first fails a combat or evade check against that monster. So this is a very, very good monster hunter. He doesn't need to have his will up very high, so we can just whack his fight to five to right off the get-go, and we'll give him high luck. And I want him to be a monster hunter, so I think I'll give him a high speed as well. And hopefully we're going to draw some weapons. He gets two common, one unique, one skill. So that's two commons, one unique, and one skill. Exhaust instead of spending $2. Awesome. That's <laughs> pretty handy. I wish that was a different person, but it's still pretty good. Actually, that's not bad because remember, it costs $2 to pick up Bass Token, which he can get for free. And uh, he'll be stopping in streets because he's going to be monster hunting. What else have we got? We've got a Tome. Exhaust and spend two movement points to make a Law 2 check. If you pass, close one gate, it cannot be sealed. Okay, so that is close a gate. This is sort of like a stopgap if you're ever in dire straits. Not too interested in this, to be honest. And we have a weapon. Okay, so plus one to combat checks, plus three for magical resistance, plus six for magical immunity. Nice. Nice little dagger, one-handed dagger. That's good. And a time bomb. Excellent. Okay, so this is allows you to basically place TNT at a location. It blows up and just destroys everything in the location. 
But what's interesting is that it returns to the Monster Cup. It's not considered a defeated monster, like you can't take trophies. So it bypasses uh, the corruption ability as well. Very, very good card for us in this game. Excellente. And the he has socially connected. After the initial setup, any time either of your partners gains an ally, the other one draws an ally. If he currently has no allies, he keeps it. If he does have one or more allies, he keeps it and then chooses one of his existing allies to reshuffle back into the deck. Okay, so that's pretty cool. It just means if he gets an ally or he gets an ally, they both get an ally. Pretty strong, because allies are strong. Okay, and now we have Zoe. She also will get her task. Oh, I forgot to do his task. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do his task in a sec. Okay. Any phase when Zoe makes a combat check against a monster or ancient one with physical and or magical resistance, ignore that ability. So we just ignore physical and resistance and any immunities is treated as resistance. It's not a particularly exciting effect. Okay, so she also gets uh, two uniques and one skill. Exhaust to reroll any spell check. That's awesome. We have a physical knife. We have another beautiful sword of glory. We have a holy water. So that is very good weapons for her. Now, where does she start? She starts at the train station. So one, two, three, one, three movement for her. She's got pretty decent combat from the get go. So let's give her a will of four and we'll give her what's it? She's only got one focus. So we're going to give her five luck. That spell check is basically useless for her. Okay, Roland, he also has a task. I'll read all the tasks out in a sec, right at the end when I do all their stories and he gets a relationship. Collectors. Okay, so basically this is kind of similar. Anytime either of these people draw common or unique, the other player can uh, also draw it and then choose to buy it at the list cost, which is pretty cool. And you don't even need to tap this, it's a permanent, which is awesome. I uh, don't think this one needs to tap either. Okay, so he gets one common, one unique, one ally. This ally says draw one skill. Awesome, so we actually get two skills. That's freaking amazing. Okay, so we have Conceal. After making a Vay check, spend two cloak tokens to add one success, okay? And we also get Sneak. That's awesome. So this person is able to basically sneak anywhere on the map. And it gets an extra focus from uh, the ally. Gives a four focus, that is insane. And we have the King in Yellow and we have a combat knife. Okay, let's have a look at his abilities. If Roland has fewer than two clue tokens, he gains a clue token, so he's always got a clue token. And if he's less than $2, he gains $1. So he's always got some money. Awesome. Wow, that's a pretty good setup for him. Oh, Joe Diamond, he's one of the original guys. Oh, we've got to do his uh, abilities. Where is he? He's up here, so he needs one, two, three as well. Okay, so his sneak is super high. So, oh, he's got four focus, so it doesn't really matter where we put anything. So I guess I will just put it here. Yeah, blam. And we'll give him a high luck. Oh, his luck is up here. Yeah, give him a high luck. And he doesn't have any weapons of any sort, but he's got a very high sneak. So I'm just going to give him... Uh, five will. Meanwhile, Joe. So basically any Joe rolls one extra bonus die when he spends a clue token. So basically every time he spends a clue, he gets two tokens. It's pretty strong. It's uh, sort of like he's one of the original characters. So 
the powers, there was a bit of power creep in this game. So he gets two commons and one skill. He has a plus will, which is very handy for a monster hunter. He has the automatic, which is one of the best common weapons. He has the ley line. Ignore all penalties to skill checks caused by environmental cards. That is awesome. And he has a plus one to luck check. Nice. So he's got a pretty decent start, I guess. And he starts at the police station and he's going to go to the graveyard. So he needs one, two, three movement. And we'll give him a will of two because it has plus one. And we'll give him a luck of three. Oh, I forgot to get his task card as well. You blamo. Boom. Okay, Leo. Let's get his task. And let's get his relationship. Either you or your partner may exhaust this card before making a horror check to gain plus one to that check. Okay, that's pretty cool. Okay, once per turn, Leo may prevent one point of stamina or sanity loss on any investigator. Okay, there's no location restrictions. This is very, very strong. It allows much freer use of tomes and of spell casting. Leo is awesome support character. Okay, so he starts with one ally. And he gets... Okay, plus two fight. And he, uh, okay, that's all right, I guess. So no stamina loss from the overwhelming ability and he gets plus two fight. And he gets two commons and a skill. After making any combat check, exhaust and add one success to the result. This does not refresh unless you spend all your focus. Okay, so that's pretty awesome. And he gets the motorbike. And he gets an old journal. Okay. So he starts at the river docks. So there's lots of clues around here. We have two people here. So let's go. I think we'll take him to Unvisited Isle. So he needs three. It's plus two fight, so I'm going to give him fight of two and a will of three. And we've got, actually, he's got two extra movement points. So let's give him a sneak, high sneak, and I'll give him a luck of four. Bam, Ashcan Pete. So he starts off with the trusty ally, which is Duke, which gives him maximum plus one sanity. So his sanity is actually five. And because this is the initial setup, it's actually, you start with max sanity. So he, he gets the plus one and he gets the, he gets it increased. So he actually starts with five instead of the four on his sheet. Let's get a task for him as well. And his ability is quite interesting. When Pete draws from the common item, unique item, or spell deck, he may draw from either the top or the bottom of the deck of his choice. And he may look at those cards at any time. So he starts with one common, one unique, and one skill. So I'll just grab his skill. And he's got Grapple, which is one of the best skills in the game. It's basically a permanent uh, blessed to uh, being permanently blessed for fighting. Awesome, which is a bit of a shame because he's really good at digging through the, uh, the, the decks. So we can now look at here and you can see we have focus increased by one and we have a task. So none of them are really of interest to me. Uh, let's have a look at his. He has a focus of one, actually. So I am going to use the unique ability to draw from the bottom of the unique item deck. So I'm going to right click on the button and that takes us with the focus is now increased by one. 
So he actually has two focus now. And I'm going to take the top common item, which is a Tommy gun. Beautiful. Excellent. And he's also going to need three movement. He's got, look at how high his sneak is. And we'll give him, what has he got here? He's got grapple. So we're going to give him three fight for will and we give him high luck. He's got really bad stats except for this snake. Okay, now we have Lily Shen, who is a very unusual looking investigator you might note because she has an extra bar at the top here. So basically, when spending Lily's focus, you can adjust her maximum sanity and stamina as though they were skills. Each time Lily increases her maximum sanity, she gains one sanity. Each time she increases her maximum stamina, she gains one stamina. Lily's current stamina or sanity can never exceed her maximum sanity or stamina. So this is an interesting ability and it's quite good to use in my opinion. Uh, she's sort of like a spellcaster that can regen sanity. So I like to start at 4-7. Okay, so that takes us to 4 and 7. And that way when I use her spells, I can move this up each turn and it will continually gain her sanity back. And then I can start moving the other way to gain her health back. So basically I just move this up and down over the course of the game. Okay, so she's at the magic shop. She starts with $4, which is not enough to buy a spell, unfortunately. And we don't have a lot of people down this side. I guess she'll go to, what's, that's four sneak for her, four sneak for her. So pretty bad sneak here as well. I think I'll just give her two. We'll give her a law of four and we'll give her a fight of well let's have a look at her spells first she gets one spell and one common and she also gets this weird martial arts ability any phase when you make a combat check gain plus two for every empty hand you have so she's plus four combat when she doesn't have weapons basically okay she's got a a tome and she has feeding the mind which is a pretty damn good spell you may cast an exhaust and sacrifice any amount of stamina up to the number of successes you rolled for each spell check for each stamina sacrifice you gain two sanity so that's another great way to get sanity and of course she can regen her uh, she can actually regen her uh, her health so that's freaking awesome. So in fact, you know what I might do? I might actually do it this way. So that gives her seven, stat, seven sanity and gives her four health. Because this is a zero sanity cost and basically we can just regen her sanity that way and then regen her health back. Okay, and she also gets a task, of course. And we'll give her a relationship. Between you and your partner, the investigator with the fewer monster trophies gains plus one on combat checks, and the investigator with the fewer gate trophies gets plus one fight or law on closing gates. But if there's a tie, nothing changes. So that's pretty cool. And now finally we have Sister Mary who starts the game blessed, which is awesome. And she also has a task, the Ablamo. And she gets two spells and one skill. Oh, fisty cuffs. After making a combat check, spend two cloak tokens to add one success to a result. You can do this as often as you like. Basically, she can insta-kill anything with two clues. 
This one here is a fantastic clue for that guy who gains clues. She also gets a holy water and the magical cross. And she gets a vision quest and wither, which is one of my favorite spells. With, uh, vision quest is interesting. Cast an exhaust to ending your movement and take all clue tokens that are on the board in your current neighborhood. So she can just hoover up clues without being at the spot. And this is one sanity cost. So she can go one. There's no real point because there's no, there's nowhere with lots of clues right now. So I think she's just going to go one, two. You know, actually what I think I'll give her three movement and I'll give her two movement, uh, her three movement as well. Actually, no, it doesn't really help, does it? Yeah, so two and two. So she'll give her a high law. Look how high her luck is. I'll give her a medium size law and luck, and I'll give her a medium size will and fight. Okay, she is never lost in time and space. Instead, her sanity is returned to zero. She returns to Arkham Asylum. If her stamina is zero, she returns to the hospital. If neither her sanity or her stamina, if neither her sanity or stamina is zero, she returns to the South Church as cursed. So basically, this is saying instead of getting lost in time and space, she gets cursed unless she's reduced to uh, one of her stats is reduced to zero, which is probably worse than. Uh, <laughs> Just get lost in time and space, but whatevs, man. Okay, so that is pretty much the whole thing. We'll just go through the tasks and the backstories, and then we're going to be calling it quits. But I'm going to save it right now because it's taking forever, and I need to get to work. I'll see you guys pretty soon for the rest of this video. Let me just save this sucker. Uh... Save it into tube tables, and I'll call this AH-01, baby. Okay, I'll see you guys soon. Okay, I'm back. I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. You know what, I should go get a beer. Yep, I will. I'll be back again. Right, I'm back. Take two. Oh, the coolness. Oh, it's just so nice. Ah, oh, nothing like a cold beer on a hot summer day after a hard day's work. That's what I say. Right, where am I? That's right, gaming. Let's get into this. So, Hank. As he was growing up on his parents' farm, it soon became obvious that Hank was more of a doer than a thinker. He wasn't stupid exactly. He just didn't spend a lot of time thinking about things through before he did them. A lot of this time, this tended to get him into trouble. Then again, sometimes it came in handily, like it had last month when he heard the cows panicking. Picking up his shotgun, Hank rushed outside, only to see some kind of giant buzzard thing attacking the cattle. Now, some might have questioned their own sanity at the sight, while others might have fainted away in sheer horror. But Hank, he just took aim and blew the darn thing's head off. It only occurred to him later to wonder just what it had been. When Pa saw the corpse, he told Hank that they were going to have to take it to the professor he knew at Mr. Tonic University. So they crated it up, drove it to the nearest train station, and hopped on the train to Arkham. Only things haven't gone so well since then. First the crate vanished off the train, and then Pa went missing when he went to complain about the missing crate. As Hank grows tired of waiting at the general store where Pa told him to meet up if they got separated, he wonders if he might not have started doing a little thinking he wonders if he might not have to start doing a little thinking after all. And that explains why he doesn't have horror checks, because <laughs> he's, he's just a bruiser. Okay, and his uh, task is, Hank was alone in a strange city and Pa was missing. Well, that was okay. He'd just go back to the train station and look for Pa. If Pa wasn't there, well, he'd worry about that later. Where's Pa? Pass. Hank may spend five clue tokens while at the train station during the upkeep phase to place the there's pa in play. So we spend five clues, we, we gather five clues, we spend it, we find pa, and fail. If Hank fails a horror check, we place the fail in play. Okay, Zoe. 
Zoe knew that she was special. She'd shown it ever since God spoke to her one night when she was six years old, the night that the terrible fire took away her parents. He told her that he had chosen her from among all the people in the world to be his agent. She would protect the innocent and punish the wicked. Since then, he came to her in times of trouble, offering guidance and comfort. He has also come to lead her to an evildoer on several occasions, each instance with his good aid, good triumph. And one day he spoke to her, telling her to come to Arkham, where she would face her greatest challenge. He had not spoken to her since. Now as Zoe steps off the train onto the platform, she fingers her cross, feeling the wrongness of this place in her bones. Perhaps if she cleanses the city of its taint, he will speak to her once again. She's basically a serial killer. <laughs> killer instincts. You know, she is a serial killer. Uh, you know what I forgot to do? Look, there's actually two cards in this deck when I did the thing. She starts with the cross as well. So she's, she's got weapons up the jacksy. Okay, let's have a look at her... Thing. As you have called me into service once again, my lord, so shall I serve. This city is thick and swollen with evil like a rotten fruit, but I will bring war to those who pervert the natural order and call upon false gods. Amen. The Crusade. If Zoe has five or more monster tokens, she wins. That's pretty much it. And if she's arrested or loses her cross, she becomes forsaken. So we just got to kill monsters. Roland Banks. Methodical. By the book. If you looked in the Federal Agent Handbook, you'd find a picture of Roland Banks next to those sections. At least, if they had any pictures, you would. Where other agents found the rules restricting and annoying, Roland took comfort in procedure. It was a relief to have guidelines to follow in every given situation. Well, at least until his latest case. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to help you in Lovecraft world, my man. Try as he might, Roland could find no mention in the handbook of what to do when he confronted the strange creatures, gates through time and space, or magic spells. This case was rapidly escalating into a fiasco, and if he dropped the ball, losing his job would be the least of his worries. Sitting outside the asylum after an interview with yet another demented witness, Roland dropped his battered agent handbook back into his briefcase and sighed. At least the agency was sending him some backup. Maybe they could help him make some sense out of this mess. That is awesome that we've got Roland Banks because we also have the Bureau of Investigations and there's his backup. These are all the agents that have come to help him in his investigation. That's just sweet. Okay, let's have a look at his thing. Roland looked through his notes again. This is ridiculous, he said. My report's going to get me locked up in the loony bin. This case has weird cults, magic spells, and the apparent end of the world. All it needs is some demented fishmen or something, and I'll have all the makings of a best-selling novel. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Bit of meta humor. If Roland has five or more clue tokens, place heck with it in play. Very, very easy to, to get that one. Joe Diamond. The job sounded simple enough. Pick up a statue at the Providence Museum and deliver it to a guy at the Silver Twilight Lodge. The money was good, and the dame who gave him the job seemed sincere. Sadly, things never work out that easily for Joe. Now the statue is missing, two people are dead, strange cultists are on his tail, and all the clues lead to Arkham. Lady Luck can be funny that way. He's already tried talking to the sheriff, but that flat foot proved to be worse than useless. Looks like it's once again going to be up to Joe Diamond to solve the case. It's not the statue itself, Mr. Diamond. It's what's inside it that's important. Carl Stanford sat behind his dark oak desk, looking coolly at Joe. I'll get it back, spat Joe. And those goons that took it, I'll add them on as a bonus. That would be just fine with us, Stanford narrowed his eyes. We here at the lodge are anxious to meet these thieves. <laughs> Hard-boiled. If Joe is at the Silver Twilight Lodge during the upkeep phase, he may spend five toughness worth of monster trophies and one unique item to finish the job. Nice. So the theme is he gets his, he, he returns the, the thieves and he also hands in an item. Very easy. Nice and thematic. Leo Anderson. Anderson took seven men with him into Utican. Two came back, more or less. Technically, three men made it out of the jungle alive, but Mitch Brown's not exactly himself anymore. As a point of fact, 
He's a blithering madman now and has already been shipped off to the asylum. Leo couldn't read the tablets they found in those runes, only Dr. Vod could of the seven of them, but he's holding the good doctor's notes in his hands. The ones Volk took before he went mad, before he killed two of Anderson's men. Now Anderson's fresh off the boat and he's got word that Dr. Phillips, the man who organized the Utican expedition in the first place, is also dead. Phillips is dead, and that leaves Anderson holding the scribblings of a murderous lunatic, scribbles with today's date circled in blood. <laughs> Listen, I won't lie to you. This is going to make the Utican look like a cakewalk. Leo tugged his collar straight and leaned forward. But this ain't no lie either. I need you. Arkham needs you. Hell, the world needs you. We're not after riches, and we're not after a lost civilization this time. We're out to save the world, plain and simple. Are you with me? Leo has three or more allies. That's pretty hard to do. That's actually very hard to do. You know what? Uh, he needs a... Uh, where was it? Over here. This report, this task here, draw one ally and gain two clue tokens and four dollars. This task we should give, we should use uh, Pete's ability to draw this from the bottom of the deck and then give that to that other bloke so he can get, that'll guarantee he gets a second ally. If I would uh, read that uh, task card when I was doing the setup, I would have actually drawn that instead of the Tommy gun. But I'll just have to send him to the, uh, how much is that? Zero dollars. Perfect. So where's Pete? Pete's down here, isn't he? Yeah. One, two, three. He'll just go to the general store and pick that up next turn. Excellent. Yeah, so he just needs to get his crew together and then he wins. Okay, Ashcan. When you've lived on the streets as long as Pete has, you see things. Things that would drive braver men screaming into the night. But you also learn to be quiet, to stay hidden, and to play stupid if all else fails. It also helps to have a good dog, like Duke, to scare away the meaner elements of the streets. Unfortunately, this time Pete can't hide and there's nothing Duke can do to protect him. His nightmares have been growing steadily worse over the last month, driving him all the way here to Arkham. Even the whiskey isn't helping much anymore. Soon he won't be able to sleep at all. Still, there are always opportunity for a man who knows how to stay quiet, as long as he isn't too picky. The nightmares just kept getting worse and worse. Last two nights, Pete woke up covered in sweat. Even Duke was starting to whimper and whine in his dreams. It had to be more than dreams. There had to be some kind of truth out there, hidden away in his nightmares. And it was time for Ashcan Pete to find out what. If Pete has a Dreamlands Gate trophy, that's all we need to do. And the fail is five or more Doom tokens on the Ancient One's track. This is a very easy one to fail. So he has to get into the dreamlands as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, we have Lily Shen, who's one of my favorite investigators. Lily Shen had an unusual childhood, to put it mildly. She was born in mainland China, and on the next day, a group of monks arrived at her home, asking if any children had been born the night before. The monks were seeking a child of prophecy, and although they were surprised to find that she was a girl, they wished to take her and train her at their monastery. Her parents, both poor and devout, agreed, after making sure she would be well cared for. The monks began her on a rigorous training program, nearly as soon as she could walk, teaching her every martial arts technique they could, going so far as to invite instructors from other countries to teach her. She knew from a young age that she was fated to perform an incredibly dangerous task when the time came, so she pursued her studies with a will. Lily learned not only a myriad of deadly unarmed combat techniques, but also how to link her mind to her body on a fundamental level, each supporting the other. Finally, last month, it happened. One of the monks awoke from his meditation screaming, The great eye is opening, the final days are upon us, before falling dead. Now Lily stands inside a magic shop in Arkham, hoping to find someone or something that will aid her in fulfilling her destiny. ha! <laughs> awesome. Lily closed her eyes and focused. Balance, grace, serenity. With every new horror that came shambling out of the shadows, Lily found it harder to return to a state of inner calm. The trial before her was so great. Surely her teachers could not have anticipated the challenges she must face. 
but she could not falter now with her destiny so close at hand. Balance, grace, serenity. Lily opened her eyes and focused. If the Ancient One awakens, place this is it in play. So very, very weird. And knocked unconscious, it's failed. So this is a very unusual ability, as in the only way this activates is if the Ancient One awakens, which actually because of the setup with the Black Goat of the Woods is pretty high chance of that happening. So we just got to make sure she doesn't get knocked unconscious. And finally, Sister Mary. Sister Mary has served the church faithfully for many years. So when she was sent to Arkham to work with Father Michael, a man whose writings she had admired for many years, she felt that she was truly blessed. Now, after witnessing Father Michael's strange mood swings and seeing some of the bizarre practices that go on in this town, she's beginning to feel that she may have been a bit too hasty. For instance, last night there was a knock on the door of the church, and when she answered it, there was nothing but a handwritten journal lying on the steps outside. Reading it, she learned of strange cults and terrible creatures that lurk in the darkness. Worse, when she laughingly showed it to Father Michael, he turned pale and threw it in the fire, yelling at her to forget what she'd seen. Now gathering her things and quietly leaving South Church, Sister Mary has decided to investigate this town, and in doing so, reaffirm her faith. How could this be? Had she become a modern-day Job, cursed and tested in her faith? The works of dread pagan gods and heretical cults were rampant in this town. Even Father Michael was shaken in his faith. How could Mary, humble servant of God that she was, hope to persevere? Father, into your arms I commend my spirit. Mary tightened her grip on her cross and marched out into the night. If this was her test of faith, she intended to see it through. Each time an investigator is blessed, put a clue token on this card. If there are two clue tokens on the card, she passes. If Mary ever gains a curse, she fails. And that, my friends, is the setup for the game. We have Shuttle Mel. We have the Bureau of Investigations. We have the Protector of Cats with Bast. We have... The Black Goat of the Woods and the Goat of a Thousand Young just spewing their filth into Arkham. And we have this ramshackle collection of dudes trying to save the world. Now, normally I draw the Mythos card during the setup phase and then just go straight to the game next turn. But I think I'm going to start drawing the first Mythos card in the first episode so that all happens in one go. And that is it. That is the setup. I know that's a very, very long video. I'm sure no one actually sat through to the end of that. But if you did, thank you very much. And I will see you guys next time.